Good morning, David Jones with the 7.30 headlines. More than 50 people, mainly homosexuals, were arrested last night in the King's Cross area of Sydney. A police spokesman said that several hundred protesters marched along William Street and into the Cross area. The group failed to disperse when asked by the police. Arrests were made and fighting started amongst several of the protesters. Police called for backup. It was totally accepted that straight people would go on a, um, a gay rights demonstration. We were political because we didn't have um, any rights. As we were going up William Street towards the cross, a young fellow came running up behind me and as he went past me he jumped in the air and he screamed out, I'll never hide again. As we walked down the first part of William Street I could see 30 or 40 paddy wagons go across the top of King's Cross into King's Cross. Even though we had a permit from the police, the parade was hijacked by the police. In a confrontation between a bunch of lesbians and gay men and the police, a whole lot of people spontaneously were on our side. They set this trap in McLean Street. It closed it off at El Alamein Fountain and virtually let us get in and then closed it off at William Street and then started bashing us up. Identity on the, on the streets of Sydney and blasphemy that I don't believe as a Christian I can just say well I'm not worried about it, I'll go away for the night and ignore it. Came in and arrested about 50 of us with a lot of violence. The justice system and the police worked hand in hand to quash demonstrations. Today it's, it's actually a, a difficult thing to conceive of how violent the police could be and how bloody-minded they could be. One of the guys was bashed, in, um, was taken into a separate cell and bashed. And we could hear that and we knew that that was happening. You know, I was uh, pissing my pants, I was starting to shit, I was convulsing. Um, so I thought I would die. Really. We owe the police a debt for making Mardi Gras such a riotous event, ultimately, that it went down in the history books. If they had not have blocked us in, we would have just dissipated and walked back to Oxford Street and gone into the various clubs and had a few drinks. In June of 1978, there had been a kind of uh, move among gay groups around the world to sort of have an International Gay Solidarity Day to coincide with the anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York. But I suggested to a few friend of my, friends of mine that to round off the, the Stonewall celebrations, which were essentially political, there was a day march and I think there was a speak out and um, I, ca I can't remember the, the program for the day, but they were essentially all revolving around various aspects of gay politics. Uh, why don't we have a party in the evening that just celebrates ourselves? And part of it, people thought, you know, why do these demonstrations always have to be dour? You know, why can't we have a bit of fun? So there was, uh, part of the idea was to try and create that fun atmosphere but it was also to try and contact more than just we sort of boring old demonstrators, so to speak, those of us who were involved in a variety of issues. There was an attempt to contact, you know, the people in the bars or the people who normally wouldn't get involved. Because I was in the Communist Party, and our group also discussed the Mardi Gras and uh, we strongly supported it as a, as a group, actually. I was active in what was called gay liberation. So when I think of this first Mardi Gras, the 78 event that everybody talks about, to me it was just another night of, of demoing. I mean, it was 
um, you know, it was just the latest in a long series of protests that was sometimes small and sometimes big. There was a big divide between what was seen as the politicos and the bar scene people. And never the twain should meet. Um, and a lot of people, when we went into bars to leaflet, would say, what are we doing this for? You know, it's a waste of time because they're interested purely in, in their lifestyle and having a good time. So we thought that if we took a march um, and made it a bit more fun, and we actually marched in the area where a lot of the bars were, down Oxford Street, we would actually get some people involved by asking them to come down and join us. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Hey. The march started up in Taylor Square and was to go from Taylor Square down to Hyde Park. I got permission from the, the, the uh, central police in the, in the city um, and I had a permit. We had a truck with some music so it was, it was going to be a bit of a street party. And when we got down to Hyde Park, we wanted to um, take the truck into the park and have, a, have our party in there. We had a, I think, a feeling that something, you know, fantastic was going to happen. We'd already done the political march in the morning um, and a lot of us didn't turn up in, you know, really different gear because it was midwinter, you know, it was June. I do remember it being quite a cold night because it was the winter, June or July. We were wearing, you know, the usual sort of thing that we wore in those days, jeans, jumper, and I was wearing my famous Afghan coat. We didn't dress up. There were some people who, because it was fun and it was enjoyment and uh, taking over the street, they felt they wanted to express themselves by dressing up. I was dressed up as a silly clown and uh, people were outrageous. There was a Pope there, I think, and there were several bishops and a cardinal or two, and God knows what else, and quite a lot in drag. Uh, and it was successful because it did bring people out. And we started off with a fabulous feeling of this would be great and we'll try and get all these people out of the bars and into the march and to increase our numbers on the way down. And a lot of people did. You know, we'd, we'd go past the bars and we'd be yelling out of the closets and into the streets and, you know, come and join us. And they did. They came off the sidewalks. It was fabulous. Some of the slogans I can remember, the, the, the slogans like, out of the bars and into the streets. It was just wonderful to take over the street and to have I'm just guessing about a thousand people, perhaps, you know, um, being there and, and, and the night was ours. Who would have predicted what was going to happen on that particular night at that particular festival, which wasn't even called like a Mardi Gras at that point in time? Um, it was like an accident of history. I remember a couple of minutes after starting thinking, how can we be dancing if the truck is going so fast? And the police, of course, were hassling us down and getting us off the road as quick as they could. Uh, it was a Saturday night, after all, in Oxford Street. We were going down Oxford Street. The police kept telling me to go faster, and I, I, was, I was going fairly slow, but the crowd behind me was sort of so busy dancing and everything that they were hardly moving. So we were pressured to go faster and faster down Oxford Street. We were like, I remember running and thinking, what am I doing in a polka dot dress running down Oxford Street in the middle of the night? As I tried to slow up to let the crowd uh, catch up with us, the police this uh, large, rather fat policeman kept on telling me to keep going and speed up, and not to slow down. Uh, and so I went, wound the windows up on the truck so that he couldn't sort of get in because he kept on sort of pulling at me and, you know, shaking me. And, and they took Lance Gowland out of the driver's seat and they got into it. Now, of course, we were all very fearful of what was going to happen. I especially had a good friend on the back who had just had open heart surgery. I mean, that was why she was on the back of the, of the tabletop truck. And they took off. He took off, the police took off with this truck, with all the people sort of like trying to grab the sides and went around the corner into College Street. We got the information or word that something was not right. Um, I think Lance, who was in the truck, had been arrested. There was just a sense that um, 
it had been a dangerous thing to do, that, that the march in general had been a dangerous thing to do and that it was the start of something that was either going to dissolve or it was going to become something really big. The demonstrators grabbed my legs and there was a tug of war between the police and the demonstrators and the people actually pulled me out of the hands of the, the police, which was quite amazing. The sort of thing that I'd never seen happen before was the, the fight back in any of um, you know, trade union demonstrations or political demonstrations. I'd never seen people actually fight back against the police, but it happened that night. And we got in front of the truck, and I must admit I was right in the front, and we held it. So we lifted the tray of the truck up and lifted the, the wheels. There was, I don't know, 20 people wrapped around the truck, lifting it up, holding it up. It was a real sort of like all of us had our arms up the front and this police guy was revving it up and he had the accelerator working so we were actually holding it back. And what I was really fearful of was people sort of giving up and moving off because I knew I was the one in the middle and I wouldn't get out in time. But there was thousands of people there I don't know, two to three thousand people, um, very agitated because they've been robbed of the Mardi Gras. The people who are marching decided that they wanted to march further and they wanted to march up to the cross. And uh, then in William Street it turned into a street, an uh, unauthorised street march. There was a feeling of anger and elation as we marched up um, William Street. And the crowd just took over then. I mean, they didn't want to stand around doing nothing. And, and in those days, well, the cross was the place to go, you know, with the nightlife. And so uh, we all went up there. I can recall saying to several people then, this is, this is a march now. We're in a protest now instead of a Mardi Gras. But we were still all buoyed up and, and full of fun and full of vim mm -hmm. and everything, walking uh, along College Street and then up William Street. There was a, quite a large group of people on William Street who said, no, 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 that's it, we have to stop here, that's where the march ends. And I was going, no, no, let's carry on, let's go, let's go. And I think there was a group who knew what was going to happen, and I didn't. And so we sort of really half ran, half danced um, up William Street. And about halfway up, we actually saw the police congregating at the top on the overhead passway. We were just like the little um, mice following the Pied Piper. <laughs> Nobody, they, we could, they couldn't stop us and we just took over the road and went up. The feeling was, as going up William Street in particular, was we just, just felt, well, it was exhilarating and there was an adrenaline rush there, but uh, we just, it was like riding the whirlwind, I would say. It was just like something powerful, but not knowing where it was going to stop. As we were going up William Street, you could hear all these police sirens. It was, they were screaming in, from all around us. We could hear police sirens and it was really scary. This was our night and we would go as far as we wanted to go beyond the permit we were given. I think that's when the police really got very, very cranky and they set this trap in Maclay Street. It closed it off at El Alamein Fountain. But when we got to our main fountain, there was again a blocking of, of police and we, we'd noticed that all the streets had police vehicles in them that we passed. So it, it was still very scary and, and we, I think we only had one megaphone in the whole crowd so it was very difficult to communicate and there was a lot of people. My memory is we got into Darlinghurst Road and into, up to the fountain and I must have been near the front getting to the LLA main fountain and then it was over and we were dispersing. Well we started dispersing but because it was such a large group and we were massed and of course the streets in Williams, well Darlinghurst Road is absolutely packed usually at that time of the night. We couldn't fit onto the footpaths. But what we didn't know is that police had cut off with paddy wagons and whatever Darlinghurst Road um, back in the main King's Cross section and then subsequently cut off the other end. And we got into uh, Dunninghurst Road and there were a lot of police wagons there. And of course they'd already blocked off the other end of Dunninghurst Road at the fountain, at the junction of Dunninghurst Road and Maclay Street. So we were sort of hemmed in. I was oblivious to the fact that, oh, this might be a trap. Just taken along by it all, but, you know, didn't take long to 
you know, before I got down to the fountain and, you know, turn around and go back, ah, oh, well, I'll grab you then, so. And we were, actually, we were actually addressed by the senior police commander that uh, the march was illegal. And so people from the parade, or from what would, had then become a march, plus a lot of people in the street in King's Cross, like, you know, ordinary people who were in the street on a Saturday night in King's Cross, you know, as the police started to try and arrest people from the, the Mardi Gras, then uh, lesbians in particular started to fight back. And I was about the third person to actually get caught by the police. And they grabbed me and there was a whole group of women who grabbed my other arm. So I was actually being split asunder by what was happening. It was the first time that I'd ever seen a policeman take his badge off and start punching somebody ever in my life. I was actually let go at one stage by the police and I had one guy lean over me and say, piss off quickly into the crowd. And then somebody came up in plain clothes and they all grabbed me again. So there was a whole lot of plain clothes cops that came. And these were meant to be, I think, the Darlinghurst cops who were well known for their viciousness um, in terms of how they treated people. And I was grabbed by an officer uh, by my hair um, and he started to drag me towards uh, the paddy wagon and the protesters, the other, some of my friends grabbed me by my legs and they were pulling one way and the police were pulling the other way. In a confrontation between a bunch of lesbians and gay men and the police, a whole lot of people spontaneously were on our side. And so I think it got really messy and a lot of people that were arrested were freed and they just got bogged down into this terrible fighting, the likes of which we hadn't seen in Sydney. Once we realised what was going on, we were pretty horrified, of, of course, course, weren't we? And, the, and the, the fizz and the happiness went right out of the whole show. Mm. I was actually involved in a struggle. My, my girlfriend at the time was was being arrested right in front of me, very violently. They strangled and had a stranglehold around her neck. And um, I was in a struggle to try and free her. And uh, the next thing, a policeman grabbed me by the hair from behind and I was just pulled backwards across the street by my hair. They dragged me over to the police van and as I was below the door, I saw this huge flash of light in front of my face and I realised it was some sort of media taking my photograph. Police violence uh, to demonstrators was very common. There was a completely different approach to policing in those days. They were pulling my hair and punching me in the face um, and dragging me um, and, and, and the more violent they became, the more determined the protesters became to keep it became to keep me in the group so that I wouldn't end up in the paddy wagon. And I remember this guy being bashed up by the coppers and I kept saying, leave him alone, he hasn't done anything, leave him alone, leave him alone, leave him alone. And the copper just smashed me in the face. We were angry and people didn't like homosexuals. For whatever reason which I still can't fathom, you know, I was singled out. So there were, there were two women and two men in the, in the paddy wagon by that time. And uh, so, you know, it was like you, you and you out and you, you can't, you stay there sort of thing. The people who weren't arrested um, knew to walk down Darlinghurst Road to the police station, uh, which is now a, you know, a health centre. And we knew that all of the people arrested, 50 whatever, 53, were inside the cells and we could actually hear people being uh, beaten up, like Peter Murphy and so on. And the guy just turned around and started belting me up, you know, like straight in the face, and all blows in the head and screaming, the guy it's sort of purple with rage. Peter was really quite badly knocked around. I don't know how they knew this, so they, but they were calling, you know, who'd bashed, who'd bashed. Perhaps I should just stop for a while. It's too much. Maybe we should stop this part. Stop this part. I can't live through it easily. No. I remember um, bailing people out 
And I know that because my name's on some of the bail slips. And I remember taking some of the people, um, in particular I remember Peter Murphy, to see a doc doctor and a lawyer. People were taking up hats and passing them around for everyone to just put their money into it. And I've never seen so much money come out so quickly um, as people reached in. And I mean, this is the time when you didn't have ATMs to go to. It was not until about 3 a.m. or something that, that, that finally the bail process started to, to take place. Finding a lawyer and a doctor early on a Sunday morning is quite difficult. I was woken up uh, in the early hours of the morning of the next day by a phone call uh, saying that uh, there'd been lots of arrests, uh, that people were locked up in police stations, uh, there are a lot of people at Central Police Station, would I go down there and help bail people out? Um, I was a barrister then and now. The, with the money that, that I had, I mean, we must have bailed out about 40, so we probably bailed out 40, between 40 and 50 people, which must have been most of the ones that were there. I think there were 53 people. That Monday morning at the court was another riot, another police riot. The, the police did block the uh, entrance to Central Court, which I'd never seen before. Even when we'd had anti-Vietnam protests with people gathering outside the gates. The police had, uh, to, well, they'd, they'd taken it upon themselves to close the court. And closing the court, of course, was illegal. It's part of the very uh, fabric of our justice system that the courts be open to the public. The magistrate and so when they found out what was going on were quite angry and ordered the police to let people in. People were very angry. They were very angry about what had happened the night before. They were very angry because it was known by then about the people who'd been injured, some of them seriously, uh, by the police the night before. They were very angry about being prevented from coming inside. Everybody knows that the courts are meant to be an open place. Uh, it's not just the law, it's, it's popular knowledge. When I arrived there and was told by the demonstrators the courts had been closed, I walked up the steps, spoke to the police and said, you can't close the courts. You have no order from the magistrate to do so. And I knew that they couldn't because the cases hadn't actually come on yet. And I turned around and, and said to everyone, uh, a bit gung-ho, uh, come on in, it, they can't close the courts. And the police were acting in the same bloody-minded fashion towards the people who wanted to get into the court building and who were pissed off with the police, as they had towards the uh, people who'd taken part in the parade the night before. And that was un unprecedented to close a court in that manner. People were being arrested there and then, taken down to the cells, and then they had to be brought up and processed in the courtroom. And so the process, uh, at the end of the day, just snowballed. We also had protests on the steps of the courthouse, and the charges were dropped. Classically, uh, police lied about what had occurred and there was so much evidence about what had occurred by way of uh, TV film footage, people having uh, cassette tapes in which they'd recorded what police had said through their megaphones directing people to disperse. There was uh, clear evidence that people weren't able to disperse from demonstrations where they'd been ordered to simply because all the exits had been closed off by the police, which was a, a classic tactic the police used at the time to trap people in uh, places in order to then be able to uh, arrest them all. And as a result, uh, many of those test cases were thrown out and consequently the police were obliged to simply drop the charges. And then when we left the court, um, the whole down the stairs from the um, Petty Sessions Court in Liverpool Street was lined with a, uh, two rows of police. It was like uh, one of those dreadful scenes. You know, We had to walk down through all these police and all of our friends and supporters were down below and quite a few of them had been beaten up and arrested as well. So it was a very violent, scary scene. far in their eyes. We'd actually, you know, <laughs> taken control, which they wanted to retain, and they had control for many years. And I think that's basically 
uh, yeah, what happened in, as far as I'm concerned. We'd gone well beyond the bounds of, you know, what New South Wales police would allow, particularly at night and particularly in Oxford Street or subsequently in King's Cross. Uh, in 1978, there was, a, there was a sort of a violent confrontation with the police because it wasn't a, apparently approved the, the, the homosexual march or Mardi Gras. And so the police apparently had orders in to stop it. I used to be a member of the Festival of Light. I was actually a foundation member of the Festival of Light in about 1970 or 71. The, the homosexual Mardi Gras, in fact, was a major promotion of the homosexual lifestyle. And also it had a, a, a sort of a a nasty edge to it that there was a, an anti-Christian element as well and so over those early years you also had uh, floats with, with words on them, uh, sluts for Jesus, uh, I'm Mother Teresa's love child. So there was quite a lot of blasphemous material as well as obscene floats which probably uh, a lot of people may not have un understood the significance of them. One of the things that's really good for any political movement is to have to continually look at itself and look at its detractors and therefore crystallise its own views. And I think Fred very much has been that person for us. Like in the, in, in the United States, it's been people like Jerry Falwell and Rush Limbaugh and in, in England it was, Margaret, it was Mary Whitehouse at the time. Um, and, and Fred's views allowed us to say, oh, well, that's not who we are and that's not what we want, which at the time I think was just as important as, as being able to say, well, this is who we are and this is what we want. The thing that distinguishes 78 is not just the arrests, but that somebody, Ron Austin apparently, said, why don't we tart this up and have a bit of fun and not just do the straight, serious thing. It had always, there'd always been something at the end of June, which was the standard, you know, straight political thing. And it's the, the, the frocking up, plus the arrests in 78, that changes it. it. It would be fair to say that a lot of straight people were radicalised by the experience of, even if only being on the margins of, let alone involved specifically in Mardi Gras and the things that flowed from it. That 1978 demo did spawn the Mardi Gras, which is still, you know, a great Sydney occasion. People have said to me quite often, oh, you see those young women going around, you know, and they've got tattoos and they've got rings in their noses and, and stuff and, and, and they're all into queer politics. You know, it's terrible. They're all into queer politics. Is this what we fought the revolution for? And I say, damn straight it is. If we didn't fight the revolution so that those young women could make choices about their political and personal lives, then we fought it for nothing. Just because they make choices we might not make doesn't mean that our revolution didn't work. And I think Mardi Gras has been a really important part of that. It's been a really important way for people to move forward in their thinking um, about what it is to be gay and lesbian in Australia. Mm -hmm.